Greetings, fellow Beyonders. I am your humble host and scribe, Sven, and this is Beyond the Worlds Beyond. The primary purpose of this series will be exploring the lore and story within these campaigns. In this special episode, we'll be looking at the first chapter of The Wizard, the Witch, and the Wild One. As a note, previous episodes have all been done in a single take. Not always the first take, mind you, but a single take. Given the scope of this episode, that seems an unlikely prospect. Editing is not something I have prior experience with, so please forgive any rough cuts in the material that follows. We'll be doing a summary of the chapter and taking a look at some of the major questions that are still outstanding. We begin this chapter with the Preludes, three vignettes that introduce us to our primary characters when they are children. The first, chronologically, if not in the episode, takes us centuries before the current time, though this fact is not immediately apparent, where Ursulon, the Wild One, in youthful roughhousing and rivalry with his siblings, passes from the world of spirits into Amora. Here he encounters an age of knights and honor personified by the questing Sir Curran. Though their meeting, and his time in the realm, is brief, it would shape the course of his future, and he returns to the realm of spirits bearing a golden pauldron gifted to him by the knight. Moving forward, we meet Suverin Kedbaraket, Suvi, our wizard-to-be, as well as her parents, Soft and Stone, and their allies, Steel and Yorin. Fleeing the citadel via travel door to the town of Silbury, they arrive to find it also under attack. Determined to see Suvi to safety before continuing whatever mission they have undertaken, her parents sent her, via magically enhanced wagon, to the care of Grandmother Wren. The wagon delivers Suvi into the final scene, that of Ame, our witch-to-be, in an otherwise normal, if whimsical and auspicious day in her apprenticeship under Grandmother Wren. The two children meet for the first time, and thus the prelude draws to a close. In the summer that would follow, Ursulon would, once more, cross into the realm of mortals, no time having passed for him despite the centuries on Amora. Meeting Suvi and Ame, the three would become fast friends and share a season of adventure. For full details, be sure to join the Worlds Beyond Number Patreon and listen to the Children's Adventure campaign. What we will come to learn through the chapter is that Ursulon found himself unable to return to the Realm of Spirits. They encountered the magical sword Wavebreaker that would end up in Ursulon's possession and they would assist in breaking a heinous curse on Grandmother Wren. Unfortunately, all things must come to an end, and as the summer draws to a close, Suvi finds not her parents, presumed dead, but Steele returning to take her to the Citadel. Ursulon, too, will depart, taking Wavebreaker with him, to try and find his place in this new, to him, world leaving Ame to finish her apprenticeship under Grandmother Wren. We then move 13 or 14 years into what will be, for the rest of the chapter, the present. Suvi, an apprentice under the Archmage Silence, is granted leave to depart the Citadel to visit Grandmother Wren as she has fallen ill and is expected to soon pass. Departing via travel door to Silbury, echoing her flight as a child, she now rushes not towards protection, but towards the parting of a loved one. Arriving at the cottage, thankfully in time, Suvi and Ame are reunited and attend to Grandmother Wren's bedside. Here they discover that Wren is not just ill, but suffering from a curse, one related to, if not the same as, that which had afflicted her when they were children. It seems this curse, which is also affecting Ame, has suppressed memories of lessons taught and truths learned, including those about who to trust. Ren, through her familiar taro, informs them that the cottage contains a magical sword that could sever the curse. Or at least it did before said sword, Wavebreaker, departed with Ursulon. Their path set before them, Ren and Taro depart from the world. 
Before the two women can set off to find their long-lost spiritual sibling, they are first visited by an ominous spirit of great power. Going by many names, among them the King of Night, he seeks entrance to the cottage, claiming to wish to pay his respects to Grandmother Wren. Ame refuses him entry in the moment by stating that he can return in one year, which he promises to do. One last task precedes their departure, and Ame finally summons her own familiar, the fox. With the fox following Ursuline's scent, the pair travel around the island of Akam. The exact length of this journey is not entirely clear, but seems to have been at least a week, if not longer. Eventually, in the port city of Joris, they finally reunite with Ursuline, who, down on his luck and disheartened at the world, has taken to performing with a traveling troupe. After reclaiming Ursuline's belongings, and sending the leader of the troop fleeing, the trio are properly reunited, though they learn that one harsh winter, Ursuline gave away Wavebreaker to a hedge mage by the name of Finley in Port Talon, as he was blackmailing Ursuline over his nature as a spirit. Thus, with their next destination decided, they begin the process of chartering a ship, eventually finding passage aboard the Rowan under Captain Emless. This would turn out to be a dangerous decision, as it is revealed that Emless is a chalice, an agent of the Dominion of Rube that allows themselves to be possessed by dangerous forces. The shadow entity within Emless attempts to attack Ame when it finds her alone and a seeming easy target. It finds some success, quickly knocking out the young witch, but not before Suvi and Ursuline are alerted to the danger and succeed at defeating the entity. With the shadow gone and Emless unconscious, Suvi ends the threat she sees to the Empire and kills the captain. This act highlights a point of contention and tension between Suvi and Ame that will arise a few times within this chapter. Arriving at Port Talon, they seek out Finley, only to discover the hedge mage apparently murdered, which they quickly deduce is all a fraud and he's just using a feigned death spell to avoid conflicts. Here, along with learning that Finley has sold Wavebreaker to local crime boss Will Gallows, the trio meet Finley's assistant Ghost and her construct companion Flicker. Ghost, it turns out, is the child of a spirit and a human, and possesses some magical gifts stemming from that heritage. Suvi recommends, despite Ame's hesitance, that Ghost should join the Citadel to receive proper training. Ghost leads them to where signs are left to alert Will Gallows, and departs. Nearby, they find a fountain with a defaced, literally, statue depicting two spirits, Naram the Wave Lord and Arima of the Reaching Green. Attempting, and succeeding, to restore the face of Naram, Ame does not do so without consequences, as she has a vision of destructive greenery and collapses, choking up salt water. Seeking to let Ame rest, they enter a local club, the same one used by Will Gallows, and meet first with his compatriots Arlie Price and the Cudgel, and finally with Gallows himself. Here he offers them a deal, since they cannot pay the coin price he proposes for Wavebreaker. If they see a local guild mage, Payne, removed from the safety of his position, he will in turn give them the sword. He sweetens the pot with the knowledge that Payne is embezzling from the Chantry, and thus the Empire, and that unseating him from his position, though not good for Payne, would also be right in the eyes of the Empire. Taking this offer into consideration, they rest for the night and learn more about the lore of the local spirits in the morning from the clerk of the hostel, as well as the enroaching kudzu that has necessitated raising the walls and lighting witch fires around the city to attempt to quell its advance. They next visit the Chantry, seeking to learn more about pain and if they truly wish to follow through with Gallo's offer. Here, they meet Moro, the head guild mage and a huge fanboy of Suvi's parents. 
He can't help but gush over the work he is doing out at sea and the potential it holds for the Empire. They accept an offer to visit the derrick and to rest at the Chantry until then. Using this opportunity, they intend to sneak into Payne's office and learn if his embezzling is true. This does not go according to plan, Payne being in his office and the interaction between him and Ursuline going south quickly. Payne injures himself to frame Ursuline and prepares to kill the Wild One. Ursuline, thankfully, is hardier than Payne suspects and survives the attack as, with Suvi joining the fray, Payne flees back into his office to begin destroying evidence. Once more, Suvi's magic, after Ursuline removes the offending door, makes quick work of the combat and Payne is not unconscious. Quick thinking, and horrendous lies, manage to keep things from spiraling further with the rest of the Chantry. The party allows a recovering pain to flee so that he might have a chance to survive, but still fulfilling the technical requirements of Gallo's offer. Later, having rested and gained some new magical items, including a magical coral ring that allows breathing underwater, they depart with Moro to view his project, the Calabell Nautomantic Apparatus. Here, he reveals that he has trapped a powerful sea spirit whose magic might help turn the tide of the war and whose blood has been responsible for some of the powerful magical items that the Chantry has been producing, including the Coral Rings. The party immediately recognizes, to their horror, that this spirit is Naram. They also conclude, correctly, that the kudzu is Arima attempting to reach out for her entrapped husband. Returning to the Chantry, they once more find conflict among themselves as to the next course of action. Suvi and Ursulan feel that the problem is outside of the scope of what they can be expected to handle, and might account to treason in Suvi's case, while Ame feels that, since she accepts they cannot directly strike at the Derrick, they should at least try to reach out to Arima. Though they seem to come to agreement to think things over and plan before acting, things play out differently. Suvi, through another citadel wizard, the Abjur Galani, learns that the citadel has feared her dead and have been seeking her for nearly a week and a half. With Suvi's sending mirror having broken in the presence of the King of Night, she has been unable to keep steel abreast of what has been unfolding. Now, through Galani's mirror, she faces chastisement by Steel, who demands that Subi keep things on ice until she arrives in a few days, at which time she will see to such matters as the imprisoned spirit. Ursulan, meanwhile, has taken to drink and decided that he would reclaim Wavebreaker that night. His meeting with Gallows goes surprisingly well. The sword is reclaimed, and an open offer is extended for further work between them, if so desired. The fox, serving as an agent of Ame's desires, if not intentions, flees the chantry and escapes the city into the kudzu beyond, forcing Ame to pursue him and sneak out of the city towards Arima's shrine, as she had truly wished to do. Suvi returns to find a drunk, if successful, Ursulan and a missing Ame, and the two set out after their friend. Managing to barely get past the gate guards, they move past the Witchfire Wastes to the Kudzu beyond. Ursulan attempts to commune with Arima, but is met with nothing but hostility and contempt. He also inadvertently makes Arima aware of Ame's presence, and the witch is quickly captured by Arima's plant servants, the Undre. In exchange for Ame, Arima demands that Ursulan bring Wavebreaker, Naram's sword, to her shrine. An exhausting, non-stop march eventually brings Suvi and Ursulan to Arima's shrine and the captured Ame. Here, they learn that Wavebreaker, when properly wielded by a spirit, can free Naram. Arima initially demands that they turn the sword over to her and free her upon the world. It seems that an offering, left at some point by Grandmother Ren, 
keeps Arima from crossing fully into Amora while it is in place. Recognizing that Arima cannot free Naram while so held back, and hoping to lessen any destruction she might wreak, they manage to convince her to allow them to free Naram in her stead, with Ursulan swearing to the task on his honor. They also learn, during this time, that Arima apparently cannot perceive Subi, with Ursulan connecting this to the pendant that Subi wears, a gift from her mother given when she was first sent to Grandmother Wren. Unfortunately, their return to Port Talon is not as successful as their departure, and they come to the attention of the Azure Battalion guards at the Wall. Attempts at deceit fall short, and an exhausted and spiraling Subi threatens the soldiers. The trio are eventually arrested and brought to the battalion garrison. Here, Galani and her mirror are once more brought forth, and steal through the mirror and a magical device known as a telemet, after public chastisement, speaks to each of the trio separately. Here she suggests to Ame that they hold off on breaking the curse upon her until they can visit the Citadel where their resources can help determine who was responsible. To Ursulan, she extends a similar offer to visit as well as to possibly join her in training with the sword. Steel promises the trio that on her arrival, she will see Naram is freed and that Moro pay for his actions. Informing the garrison that Subi will face court-martial at the Citadel, the party is released and return to the Chantry to ostensibly wait for Steele's arrival. Back in his room, however, Ursulan, seeing the coral ring made from Naram's blood, strikes down to destroy it with Wavebreaker. This shatters the ring, but also returns it to its supernatural state of spiritual blood, blood that eventually is absorbed into Ursulan's wounds. This not only endows him with the magic that the ring contained, the ability to breathe beneath the waves, but unlocks a memory from when he was a very young child, before he had ever entered the realm of mortals, where Naram had saved him from the deep. Between this memory and his oath to free Naram, he is overcome by quest fever and decides that he cannot wait for Steele's arrival. Naram must be free, and he must be free as soon as possible, and begins to head towards the water. Ame catches Ursulan's departure and takes off after him. Suvi, witnessing this from a distance and having taken to heart a lesson from Steel that wizards cannot control spirits nor witches, does not interfere and remains in her room studying notes from her parents that she had taken from Moro's library. Ame is stymied in her pursuit of Ursulan when a battalion ship turns back her stolen rowboat. Ursulan, swimming, meets no such resistance, and uses his spiritual gift of invisibility to bypass the protections used by the apparatus beneath the waves. Here, he meets with the trapped Naram, who reveals that the apparatus was never strong enough on its own to hold him, but that when it struck him, he was stuck upon his own spear, and breaking free from both would have unleashed a wave of destruction upon poor Talon. Instead, Naram was patient, allowing his blood to be taken and used so it would find its way out into the world to find help. And that has now paid off with the arrival of Ursulan. Entrusted with the task, Ursulan swims beneath Naram and, calling upon aspects of his spirit he had lost connection with, frees the great spirit with a divine smite, truly coming into his own as a paladin. Unfortunately, this draws the attention of the magics of the apparatus and, while they were not sufficient to truly hold or harm a great spirit, Ursulan is not yet so powerful. Our wild one is trapped and finds the magic tearing apart his very being. Naram, of course, will not stand by and allow this cub to die in his stead. However, he hesitates between the choice to sacrifice himself or the lives of the mortals upon the apparatus. 
Even from her far vantage point, Ame can sense this hesitance, and reaching out nudges Naram's choice. The mages have drawn the consequences upon themselves. So decided, with a simple to him motion, the apparatus is destroyed, hurled far into the deep seas, and Urslan is freed and restored. Morel, of course, will not stand by and see his prize escape, and begins to rally the mages of the Chantry to attempt to recapture Naram. Galani is swifter, however, and unaware of all of the details of the situation, attempts to stop what she sees as a hostile force. Naram, despite her strike against him, sees the deeper intention and spares the wizard as he sends a tidal wave to douse the witchfires outside the city, though unfortunately he can not spare the soldiers stationed at those fires, and they are swept away as well. This frees the green in his attempt to breach the city walls and reunite Arima with her husband. Realizing this, Suvi rallies the Azure Battalion against the greater threat facing the city. Realizing that the wall will fall and the only decision is where and how badly, Suvi risks herself. Grabbing one of Arima's Andre, that had just a moment before been strangling her, she mounts a horse and rides into the city, the wall behind her cracking and sending the green rushing in pursuit of her. Galani takes to the skies overhead to help direct Suvi's ride to avoid areas where innocents might be harmed as they lead the hostile plants towards the harbor. Meanwhile, Moro has led a flight of mages in a whirlpool of his own creation into the deeps to attempt to capture Naram once more. He is tackled by Ursulon, which breaks his concentration and dooms those mages who had chosen to follow him. Moro, in turn, attempts to disintegrate Ursulon, but is thwarted by Naram. Ursulon pins Moro among the coral at the seafloor to leave him to his fate. Though Naram shows a minor mercy in granting Moro the ability to breathe underwater. During all of this, Ame has been attempting to rally the people of the city and construct an offering to the spirits to hopefully help ease their ire. From here, she bears witness to Subi being unseated from her horse by the Undre she had been carrying. Suvi attempts to reason with Arima and finally recognizes that the spirit cannot sense her and that this is due to her amulet. Pulling it off, she once more reaches out to Arima, but the spirit in her fury will not listen and her forces prepare to strike down the wizard. Ame attempts to command Arima to halt in this attack on her friend, and while this does succeed in sparing Suvi, it is only because Arima instead seeks to strike Ame down for this act. As a spear of venomous plant life strikes towards Ame to end her life, it is intercepted by Naram, arriving with Ursulon, both in their glamoured forms, who takes the blow and the poison upon himself. Thankfully, it seems that Naram is well acquainted with his wife's fury and knows she will withdraw her poison from him. Learning that Ame has been cursed, and knowing the importance of the knowledge and wisdom Grandmother Ren would have shared, he implores Ursulon to break the curse using Wavebreaker as Arima draws him back to be reunited with her in the realm of spirits. Between Suvi explaining things to Galani and Ame attempting to aid with the cleanup, the trio eventually reunite once more in the aftermath of the chaos. It is decided that Ursulan will attempt to break the curse, and finding joy and honor, and honor and joy, he succeeds, though not without a cost for Ame. The curse was multi-layered and set to destroy both mind and body when broken. Her will is strong and her memories are kept intact, but while she is not struck down fatally, her body is not so lucky and she and the fox both lapse into a coma. Suvi, investigating the black bile the curse leaves behind, finds a familiar scent, that of urine. 
Ursuline and Subi spend the evening and night caring for Ame until Steele's eventual arrival and great frustration at what has unfolded and chastisement due to such. She states that Ame should be taken to the Citadel right away as they can supposedly aid with her condition and once more extends an invitation to accompany them to Ursuline, who accepts. They set off shortly upon the airship that Steele had used to travel to Port Talon, and over the course of a few days draw within sight of the Citadel. During the travel, Subi has once more been studying her parents' notes and makes a surprising discovery. Earlier, she had remembered a unique contracted method of casting the mending spell that her mother had used when she was a child. Within the notes, she finds notation that reveals this contraction is due to the removal of the reflexive indicative, a gesture within wizardly spellcasting that, according to the teaching of the Citadel, is necessary for all magic. It seems that this is not the case, that it may allow for swifter spellcasting and upends a lot of magical theory around the Lingua Arcana. Sitting with the weight of this knowledge, Steele takes her aside, promising to finally tell her about her parents and Yorin and what happened when she was a child. And with that tantalizing cliffhanger, does this clip chapter draw to a close. Whew! That was a hell of a ride, even in summary form. If you haven't listened to the actual campaign and are just using this summary to catch up, I implore you to go and listen to it in full. Not only is there so much, especially in terms of character interactions, that I could not include, but the sound design and editing are downright magical in their own right and need to be heard to be properly understood and appreciated. This is easily the most impressive and immersive actual play experience I've encountered, and this summary doesn't even scratch the surface when it comes to doing it justice. So now, let's take a look at the big outstanding questions we've been left with. The first, and most obvious as the driving force of this chapter, is the nature of the curse upon Ren and Ame. Who was responsible, and what was the reason for it? His scent upon the bile suggests that Yorin had some hand in it, but we just saw blood being used to empower magic earlier in this chapter. It's true that Yorin is no spirit, but it does not mean that his blood might not be usable in such magic as well. So is he the perpetrator, or just another victim and a tool in its casting? Given that it ties into the fate of Suvi's parents, if it is not Yorin, then the other likely culprit would be Steel. Her suggestion that they delay breaking the curse and her insistence on bringing Ame to the Citadel would certainly be suspect in such light. There is, of course, the chance that it is a force we have not yet encountered, but I suspect we've met the culprit, or one of the culprits, by now. In any case, there is also the question of why. Is it a geopolitical issue in support of the Empire or Galthmai or another force and the ongoing wars? Does it pertain to her parents' discovery regarding the reflexive indicative? Which, I suppose, can be our next big question. What will the overall importance of this discovery regarding the Lingua Arcana be? Does it truly speed up spellcasting in the way it seems? If so, then it is an incredibly powerful discovery indeed. If the impact, in terms of casting, is minor, there is still the fact that it completely changes the rules, as they were taught at least, regarding spellcasting for wizards. Is this knowledge that others in the Citadel knew and chose to suppress, or is this truly a novel discovery? If it was known, but the alternative of always including the reflexive indicative continued to be taught, is there some other reason? Does the reflexive indicative have some other importance that the Citadel is relying upon? 
In either case, it raises the question as to what other rules and facts about the lingua arcana are not in truth fact, but only assumption or tradition, and what impact that will have on the study of wizardly magic for Suvi, at least, if not the world, going forward. The thought of magic and its study brings up a smaller question, but one that I know a lot of fans have been asking, which is the fate of Ghost and Flicker. Did they succeed at attempting to sign up for the Citadel, or were they rejected? Did they escape the chaos of Naram breaking free unscathed? If they did find acceptance and were unharmed, then there is definitely a chance that we might get to see them again if the next chapter is centered on, at least in the beginning, the Citadel. Next is the matter of the King of Night and his intentions. His approach, and the impacts on the world around him, were certainly disquieting, and he is definitely an imposing figure. That said, as dangerous as his presence innately seems, he did not try to force, threaten, or cajole his way into the cottage. If his motives were truly hostile, he accepted having to wait a year to play them out very easily. Of course, as an ancient and powerful spirit, I suppose a year is not truly a great deal of time. Also, it may be the case that Ame's status and ties to the cottage gave her enough power, even if she was unaware of it, to enforce such a limitation upon him. Still, were he truly nefarious, I can't help but think he would have tried at least a little harder to gain access before the new Witch of the World's Heart could truly come into her own. It may simply be the case that he indeed only wished to pay his respects to the passing of Grandmother Wren. It certainly is not beyond the realm of belief that she would have such connections nor that she would be held in regard by spirits even those of a darker inherent domain. Past Brennan games certainly suggest that spirits of death and darkness are more often misunderstood, or even friends, rather than foes, but I try not to let such past history impact my assumptions about this game too much. Another outstanding question is the nature of Sir Curran's quest centuries ago. This was an age of knights and swords, an age that Gallows, in the modern day, claims was ended due to the changes wrought by the discovery of wizardly magic. Did Curran's quest have a role to play in this discovery? If so, does it tie into the heart of the world, given that he was traveling near where Wren's cottage now stands? Was he attempting to thwart the discovery and exploitation of these secrets and failed? Or was he attempting to discover them only for what he found to later be abused? If it is true that Curran and the World's Heart helped give rise to the concepts that became wizardly magic, does this tie into the creation of the desert that surrounds the Citadel? We are told it was once a great forest that the wizards ended up reducing to glass. We know that the wild forest of the spirit realm at times exists within and without and alongside the forest near Grandmother Wren's cottage, but there may have been other points where it overlapped as well. Was the Great Forest one of these, and the attempts to draw upon the Wild Forest for the Lingua Arcana what led to the creation of the desert? I suspect this is a question that may be answered early in the next chapter as our trio explore the Citadel itself. There is also the question as to the fate of Akam after the events of this chapter. The people of Port Talon have found renewed respect for the spirits and may move back towards older ways. Galani, at least, recognized that this was not something the Empire could interfere with, at least not openly and this soon. But will other forces of the Empire see things the same way? Also, what of forces outside of the Empire? We already know that Ruv had agents working within a calm and now the Empire Fortune stationed there have suffered a massive blow. 
If there was ever an optimal time to attempt to invade the island, it would be in the aftermath of these events. We are also told that Gauthmai had agents active there as well, though we have not directly witnessed any, to our knowledge at least. Hopefully, our visit to the Citadel will also answer more about the nature and structure of the Empire, as well as the nature of the wars that are currently being waged. We know the three major players involved, but not the actual dynamics as to how the conflict came to be, nor how these nations relate to each other in their history and geography. Similarly, the fact that each of the three powers seems to follow a different magical tradition is something I hope we see explained and explored more. Is it that these differing traditions are what led to the conflict, or is it that these traditions are simply what allowed them to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with each other, but were not directly causal to the wars? Finally, what is behind Ursulon not being able to return to the Realm of Spirits? He successfully passed through and back once before, but now can no longer return. At first, it seemed like it might have been the loss of his breath, his deeper spirit nature. But we see him reclaim this in freeing Naram, yet even Naram still notes that he is way shadowed and trapped despite this. It seems there is something deeper keeping Ursulon trapped in this realm. Similarly, it is easy to think it might be his self-doubt, but that developed after he was trapped as a child, not before, and it lessening with him finding and realizing truths about himself and his honor does not seem to have had an impact. So it seems there is still a mystery to unravel here as well. Of course, there are countless other questions to ask. Will Moro escape and seek revenge? Will the party partner with Gallows again in the future? Is Gallows actually undead? And so on and so on. But there is only so much time in any one episode, even an oversized one such as this. As such, do you please share the outstanding questions you have about the story and that you hope we see addressed in the upcoming chapter in the comments below. That's all for this very special installment of Beyond the Worlds Beyond. Please consider liking and subscribing if you have not already. If you want more Worlds Beyond number content, you can also visit my Patreon, linked below, to find my appendix and timeline projects, all of which are free and publicly available. I've been your host, Sven, and thank you very much for listening. Farewell, for now, fellow Beyonders.